Hello and welcome. I'm Pam Moore and this is Hidden History, celebrating Black History Month. We're here in San Francisco at the Museum of the African Diaspora as this museum celebrates its 15th anniversary in front of this mosaic of regular folk and luminaries. We're using this opportunity to explore African American art in the Bay Area with a well-known and popular gallery in Oakland to this significant site in the city. MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora, is celebrating its 15th year in 2020 and with a new leader who has deep city roots. Oh my God, it's so exciting. Um, I tell you, um, to be leading this institution at this time uh, it's really exciting for me, especially as uh, being um, a native San Franciscan. Manetta White is looking to expand the museum's outreach to newcomers, as well as engage longtime art lovers to experience Black History Month here. This is home. Uh, this is, you know, Black History is every day here at Moad. Um, we feel that we're a house that educate uh, people about black culture, uh, supporting uh, the contemporary artists that uh, showcase their work here. Among the black history exhibits, a collection of photographs by an artist challenging the beauty standards of the 1960s. The whole idea of this was, I'm gonna shoot these people so they can see the beautiful how they are and they should stay this way. And they would wear their hair like this over the weekends and then they'd go back straight for work because they weren't accepted. An issue astonishingly relevant today, six decades later. The animated film Hair Love won an Oscar this year. The creators stressing their concern about discrimination in the workplace based on hair. A law about the issue already passed in California. It all stands as a striking example of Moad's relevance. We're a part of the city, and you know, I always say this to everyone, San Francisco needs us. This is the Joyce Gordon Gallery in the heart of Oakland for 17 years, showcasing primarily black fine art. There are not a lot of galleries, fine art galleries, around that show or exhibit artists of color. It's like art and then black art and then other art and other art when it's art you know and um, it's fine art. She is encouraged that perceptions are starting to change among people outside the black community. When they uh, come in and see and it's like oh wow I mean, they're really amazed to see the or experience the creativity of black artists. It evokes all of these feelings and you can relate to it. They can, oh, you know, you get something out of it. David Bruce Graves is the current featured artist. His show is called Heaven and Earth. Heaven and Earth is a metaphor and it speaks to the overall unity between the cosmos, humanity, in this case, more specifically, Afrocentric humanity. Joyce Gordon says she is in a perfect spot for all races and ethnicities to find inspiration during Black History Month and beyond. Chanel Stone's work focuses on finding spots of nature in the urban environment. And of course, protecting nature is a big issue in California. Did you know that in the 1800s, a group of black men helped to protect and conserve Yosemite National Park? Anthony Bailey reports on that hidden history. Our national parks are home to some of the most iconic views in the world. When you look across here, you're seeing the South Fork of the Merced River. You're seeing the, the varying uh, coniferous trees that we have here, and deciduous trees. National Park Ranger Shelton Johnson teaches visitors about Yosemite. Among the reenactments and talks he presents is the story of a group of African-American troops called the Buffalo Soldiers. Their name given by Native American fighters who hearken their hair to the crown of a buffalo. If you could bring those soldiers back and put them right here again, it wouldn't look that much different than what they experienced themselves. In 1866, the Army sent the group, which included Civil War veterans and other soldiers, to the wilderness we know as Wawona. The group was comprised of the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry. So roads had to be built, hotels were built, lodging of various sorts were built, and they were all built for the convenience of visitors. 
For the next several summers, a few hundred soldiers would camp in a tent city at the headquarters located in the A Loop of the Wawona campground. They essentially, they were serving as some of the first park rangers anywhere in the world. National parks were a new idea. Poaching and timber thieves were new to families accustomed to exploration and life in the Wild West. So basically they were providing a presence of discipline, a presence of authority, so that people knew that the park was under the command of these forces. The national parks and park rangers would not be established until years later in 1916. The Buffalo Soldiers also left their mark in the area of conservation. And on those slopes behind me, the Buffalo Soldiers actually built in 1904 an arboretum. It is believed to be the first museum in the national park system. Although some contributions are gone, Ranger Johnson says that other connections are still very present. The hat that I'm wearing on my head right now derives from the cavalry hats that were worn by U.S. Army troops both in Yosemite, Sequoia, and Yellowstone. That history of the African-American contribution to the national parks is what Johnson is working to keep alive and inspire others. We didn't just come along after this was set up. We were part of the setting up. We were part of the building of the, this idea. Coming up, we'll hear from someone who is possibly the last living Buffalo soldier in the U.S. and the stories he remembers from serving in World War II. the Bay Area's hidden history. Young black men have been fighting in America's wars since the beginning, whether the Tuskegee Airmen or the Buffalo Soldiers. In fact, Rod Carter reports from Tampa Bay on the man who may be the last living Buffalo Soldier. Retired Army Corporal Steve Lewis is living history. I was in 12th grade when the uh, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. The 97-year-old Manatee County veteran vividly remembers the day that changed America forever. It was on Sunday, and I and I didn't. And so it says Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, and I, we didn't have a, you know during that time we didn't have no TVs. We had a radio. Although after Pearl Harbor, Lewis enrolled at Florida A&M College in Tallahassee, now FAMU, a country at war meant studies took a back seat. Every man in college. But John had to be an enlisted reserve corps. Eventually, he was assigned to the 9th Cavalry, one of two black cavalries known as the Buffalo Soldiers. The all African American groups started during the Civil War. Their service, though, lasted until 1948 when President Harry S. Truman integrated the military. And by the early 1950s, they were gone. And we didn't know a thing about the Buffalo Soldiers in the Army. Okay. We, we never heard it. Mr. Lewis may be the last living Buffalo soldier around. He remembers his duties well. You man was assigned a horse, and you had to take the horse. You had to go out, you ride the horse, bring him in, wash him down, clean him up, feed him, mm -hmm. then you go eat. Ralph Barnett is putting together a documentary about the Buffalo soldiers. In spite of the huge swath of American history that they cover and the, their importance in American history, the, uh, the story has never really been told. Mr. Lewis is going to be a big part of that film. They don't give the, 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 the uh, publicity it needs. For Hidden History, I'm Rod Carter. Coming up, we take a look at the hidden history of a black football player who suffered brutal racist attacks on the field that ultimately paved the way for future athlete safety. Welcome back everybody. Reporter Kai Torque introduces us to a black football player of the 1950s. He endured brutal physical and verbal racist attacks. Amazingly, his experience led to a safety protection that football players still use today. A gridiron in Oklahoma, 1951. It's like the racial injustice just comes to life. A battleground that still haunts Deanie Bright Johnson nearly 70 years later. Nightmares of her dad, the best college football player in the country, 
with a broken jaw and zero sympathy from the stands. People just, oh, that's the way it is. That's the way we play football. I mean, that's, that's, that's a terrible, terrible situation. Johnny Bright, Drake University superstar, Johnny Bright explodes into the end had been the first black player ever to step in this stadium. On this visit, opponent Wilbank Smith wanted to make sure he'd never come back. I was in the press box at the time, and two or three plays, I said, boy, they're really getting after John, you know. He was watching his teammate run the ball, so he let his guards down just for a moment. Then, a devastating blow to his exposed, unprotected face. Moments later, a second strike, and then a third. But before his team carried his limp body off the field, he launched a statement 61-yard touchdown pass, ready to be the face that changed the safety of the game forever. The best way to retaliate is to be great. And that's a page that you could take from Johnny Bright. Johnny Bright's legend took off in Fort Wayne, Indiana, from Central High School Phenom all the way to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, schools, awards, and stadiums inspired by his name. My dad would say football sports is the vehicle. His love and his passion was educating people. And her dad comes through for all of us. Every time we see a football helmet, right after the attacks on him in Oklahoma, a national conversation on player safety fired up. The NCAA would soon require all players in the league to wear face masks. As the discussion grew, the NFL would make the same requirement several years later, making Bright's impact on this global game Undeniable. Right runs wild for the goal line, and the Eskimos are back in the lead. What would your dad say if he could see all the players wearing face masks today? He would say it's absolutely amazing. He'd probably have tears in his eyes and say, you know what, we've really come a long way. Coming up, the hidden history behind the man who was a key organizer of the March on Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. The Bay Area's Hidden History. Everybody knows Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s iconic I Have a Dream speech from the March on Washington in 1963, but not so many know about one of the key organizers of that march. Jesse Tenor introduces us to the hidden history of A. Philip Randolph and the legacy he leaves behind. More than 40 million people travel through Washington, D.C.'s Union Station every year but very few stop and stare, much less take a picture, of this civil rights icon who watches over the historic transportation center. They called him a gentle giant, but they also called him the most dangerous Negro in America. Asa Philip Randolph was the most prominent civil rights leader to emerge from the labor movement. He founded the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, the country's first predominantly black labor union that represented thousands of railroad workers. William Pretzer, a curator at the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of African American History and Culture, says Randolph's prominence spanned four presidential administrations, as he also worked to desegregate the Army and ban discrimination in the defense industries. His influence culminated with the famous March on Washington in 1963, the demonstration Randolph co-organized. It brought a quarter of a million people to the National Mall, but only after he convinced President John F. Kennedy to let it happen. Young folks were climbing the trees. I was one of the tree people. There were people of all color, black, white, brown, Native Americans who just wanted to be there. 
That's where Clayola Brown, the president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, first heard Randolph speak. He stressed the importance of freedom and jobs for all Americans. Broke is broke. The only color that matters in that kind of a discussion is green. But the speech everyone remembers from that day is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream. Randolph wanted an opportunity to let the nation see who he was and to let young people see that they were represented. During his lifetime, many recognized the contributions Randolph made to the country, including President Lyndon B. Johnson, who awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But today, very few Americans know the name Asa Philip Randolph. But just like Pretzer and Brown, this monument helps to keep Randolph's legacy alive. I would urge folks to slow down every now and then and take a real look. And recognize what it took for people like Randolph to change the course of history. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor. Still ahead, music plays a big part in African American history and culture. We take a look at one group trying to preserve a particular music form, one hymn at a time. Music is so important to black history, whether it's jazz or R&B, rap or gospel. But one aspect of gospel, call and response, is not practiced so much anymore. So Dee Griffin takes us to church. Inside Greater Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church, an old art form has taken on new life. Out of each one of those um, hymns that we do, it has a message. The Disciples of Praise do what's called Raising Hymns. It's a form of song known as call and response that dates back to slavery. Back in the slavery time, quite naturally, they didn't want them to know how to read, so they couldn't read. But but as it went older and older, you may have had the preacher or some designated one that, you know, would read it. Or they may not then have a one book. The hymns fall into categories of standard, common, metered, and long, varying by the length of the notes. I like, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, or whither shall I go? What did thine only son endure before I drew my breath? Uh, that's one I love. If, if God take his hand from me, then where will I go? Um, it's because he, he's the reason why I live. He's the reason why I'm here. As instruments have increased in popularity during services, this form of music has seen a significant decrease in many churches, but it's been just the right beat to keep this group in harmony. What's so unique about it is a bunch of men from different backgrounds, from different churches come together and be able to coexist. And th that was one of the things that was so unique about our um, group. Through song, they're using their voices to raise more than just hymns. We are our anniversary, and we are raise this money for our, our scholarship people who come in from um, from various churches. While raising hymns has become a dying art, this group is using it to keep history alive. If it dies, then they'll never know about their history. And if you don't know where you came from, then you, you don't know pretty much where you're going. So everybody needs to know about their history. For Hidden History, I'm Dee Griffin. I'm Pam Moore. Thank you for watching Hidden History, celebrating Black History Month.